Good evening, everyone. We are going to switch slides here and uh, begin our program. Thank you all for, for joining us. And if you haven't already in the chat, introduce yourselves and tell us where you're from. All right. So, Dr. Anvery, I will turn it over to you. Hello, hello. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, excellent, excellent. Welcome, everyone. Happy Monday, happy Monday, and happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. We are overjoyed to have all of you join us this evening for a very important action-oriented discussion. COTED was established to ensure that these conversations are not only happening, but that we can also create outcomes that will bridge the gaps in healthcare disparities and be part of a profession that represents, all, represents and serves all people, populations, and communities equitably. With that said, the APIDA community is no different. And when our sisters and brothers from this community reach out and for support and for space to elevate their voices, COTAP prioritized creating a platform. We have hosted two Instagram Lives to initiate the discussion and are now here this evening with our third event. I am so excited to hear our keynote address and listen to our esteemed panelists. You are all in for a treat. And again, welcome everyone. I pass it to Dr. Johnson to share the objectives for this evening's event and discussion, and also to share our community rules. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Anverizade. Um, so for our objectives, um, all attendees will gain a greater and nuanced understanding of the racism, discrimination, and violence that our Asian brothers and sisters face in this country. Also, attendees will appreciate the importance of visibility and representation of the Asian American, but Asian experience in general in occupational therapy education, as well as occupational therapy practice. And last but not least, attendees will be able to identify ways to stand in solidarity as students, practitioners, researchers, and educators with the APEDA community. As part of our community rules, we all commit to using I statements in our discussion. We also agree that everyone has their own truth and that we will respect everyone's lived experiences. We commit to moving forward and moving back in order to allow space for others to complete their thoughts. We also agree to discuss the problem and not the person and to listen and support. Now, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Park. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, before we engage in a centering activity as we lead the session, we'd like to invite attendees to participate in a narrative storytelling activity in written form. So this process is an opportunity for our community to share stories, really break the pattern of invisibility and fight against this idea of the monolithic model minority myth and really celebrate the diversity and beauty of our cultures and honor our ancestors whose shoulders we stand upon, who provided us a common language and a voice to speak our truth. So I'm including a link in the chat right now, and this will remain open for some time. And so please do not feel pressured to or obligated to participate. But if you'd like to reflect and share uh, your stories in your own time, we really do welcome that. And we also welcome um, you to share the link with others that may be interested in sharing their stories as well. 
Um, next, I want to acknowledge that some of the discussions we'll be having tonight may be heavy and difficult for some. So we want to encourage everyone to really honor your emotions and processing at your own pace, but also do what you need for your own self-care and well-being, whether that means keeping your camera off, stepping away, or even leaving the meeting if needed. Okay, so now we'll begin an activity to center our hearts and minds as a collective community to be present in this time. Let's begin by taking three slow breaths. Inhale. Hold your breath and muscle tension. And exhale slowly. Letting go of the stress and tension from your day from the interactions with your clients, colleagues, family members, students. A second breath. And exhale and put aside the work you need to get to, the email, documentation, or studying, as you clear your mind and body of all concerns and worries. And on the third breath, as you exhale, we will say, I release my mind and body from the day. And now we'll take three more slow breaths. And in the exhalation, we will say, I'm choosing to be in this present moment in front of this community and work. A second breath. And in the exhale, I let go of trying to control this time or trying to be any other way than myself. And with our final breath, we exhale and we say, I bring my mind and body into the present. And lastly, we close with saying to ourselves, I am centered within my calmer, stronger self. Thank you so much, Dr. Park. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Arabit. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Kathleen Wong Lau, our keynote speaker for the evening. Dr. Wong Lau is San Jose State University's Chief Diversity Officer. Serving on the cabinet, she provided vision, direction for university-wide efforts to ensure a welcoming, safe climate for equity. Previously, Dr. Wong Lau joined San Jose State from the University of Oklahoma where she served as director of the Southwest Center for Human Relations Studies and the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in Higher Education. Previous to that, she served as a faculty in communication studies at Western Michigan University. Early in her career, Dr. Wong Lao served as tutor and advisor for Upward Bound and as a bilingual education counselor for a TRIO program in San Francisco Chinatown where she addressed the educational challenges facing Southeast Asian refugees. At San Jose State University, she is currently working on a deep dive learning platform based online asynchronous summer institute on deprogramming racism in health and human sciences education, which will have participants from nine higher education institutions. Her doctorate is in communication with an intercultural concentration at Arizona State University. She is an intergroup dialogue researcher and facilitator. She was named in 2015 by Diverse Issues in Higher Education as one of Women's History Month's top 25 women in higher education, contributing to transformation and change in the United States. A California native, and a first-generation college student, Dr. Wong Lao grew up in the East Bay area. She and her partner have two grown children, two elderly parents who live with them, and four rescue dogs. She's bilingual since childhood. She speaks fluent Cantonese, 
And I just want to add that Dr. Wong Lao and I have worked together with students at San Jose when I was a faculty in residence on issues concerning immigration and the Dreamers Act, the Supreme Court decisions, as well as uh, issues with the Black Lives Black Lives Matter movement. Without further delay, please let's welcome and give a virtual round of applause to our keynote speaker, Dr. Kathleen Wong Lao. Thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. You're welcome. Um, and I certainly appreciate the connection and the invitation um, to speak. It's such an honor to speak on such an important topic. And so I'm just uh, honored to um, appear in front of uh, COTAD. So. Um, and thank you for all the organizers and everybody. So um, I, I'll be sharing a screen later um, towards the end, end of my talk, but right now um, I'll just uh, I'll just start to start with my my um, keynote. Two weeks ago, I sat in with my dad on a video appointment with his physician regarding an adjustment on his diabetes medication. The doctor, our family doctor of over 45 years, asked my dad if he exercised and went out for walks. My dad said he worked in the yard. He loves gardening, he has a green thumb. The doctor with good intentions told him that he should go out for walks. I chimed in that he was only allowed to go out for walks if he was accompanied by my children. My dad said he didn't want to be attacked. The physician looked troubled and started saying that if my dad was vaccinated, he could start walking more around the neighborhood. I told the doctor that I also had stopped jogging by myself in the mornings before I started the day. I felt like my gray hair made me an easy target. We live in the East Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area where there have been numerous attacks where a lone assailant runs up, punches victims in the head or face and runs off or speeds off in a car. Many are not reported and do not make the news. They might make the next door or the local edition of the patch on neighborhood news. Most occur during the day. The doctor told us he was very sorry. There was a very awkward silence. Last week, as a cabinet member, I staffed a meeting with our university president and the Asian Pacific Islander staff group on our campus to talk about priority issues for the APITA Center, an Asian Pacific Islander Desi American Center. And we also talked about issues of employees and students, as well as feedback about the experiences that people were having on our campus. There was talk about the bamboo ceiling, prejudice against people with Asian accents, and a more frequent statement that has been emerging around the country in circles that I've been in, where specific Asian American and Pacific Islander staff have been told by some of their coworkers that because of our proximity to whiteness, we're actually not um, BIPOC people, that we're not people of color. I have heard again, I'm telling you, I've heard similar things being said to APETA people across the country in all kinds of work settings and all kinds of organizations. This really belies um, the outsider experience that many APETA folks have in dialogues about race in our country. And this has been historically true, it's not something new, but is being verbalized more towards people in our community. So at the very same time that APETA folks are experiencing anti-Asian hate and the rise in anti-Asian hate um, because, because we're being blamed and stereotyped for starting or continuing the impacts of COVID-19. At the same time that we're struggling to be allies, we're often again told that we aren't part um, of the group of people of color and in fact that we are almost white. And so for many of the folks in this, um, in another meeting that I was in, these comments feel very disorienting in the time that we're in. Here's another story. One of my family is being put onto a new medication. I'm trying to find information on specific clinical studies or indicators for Asian Americans, but there is nothing. But I can find an article that tells me why it is so hard to find information. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are 24 million in our country and make up about 7% of the population. Within 10 years, 10 to 15 years, the APETA population will likely double. This cross-sectional study found 529 clinical research projects focused on Asian American, Native American, and Pacific Islander participants funded by the NIH between 1992 and 2018, composing 0.17% of the total NIH budget, not even a quarter of a percent. 
This proportion of the total NIH budget has only increased from 0.12% before the year 2000 to 0.18% after the year 2000. For African Americans, it is also woefully low and inadequate at 2%, even though African Americans are 13.4% of the United States. So I stumble across studies that talk about how Asian Americans are tinier in stature and yet can develop side effects even with lower doses of medications. But researchers have not done enough study and don't know why and don't know the biologic mechanisms for this. And so I struggle in trying to give advice to my parents about their medications. This is the last story. And this is one that maybe you have heard in your community because of the nature of the research. This is actually a, 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 good, a good story. Um, and it's about um, Okinawans. So many of you have heard of studies about the blue zones um, where um, octogenarians and cent uh, centenarians live a very long life in certain zones in the world. And so in these studies that came out about 10 years ago, researchers went to Okinawa and what they observed was a long, not only a long life, but a lack of fragility, maximum flexibility and strength and mobility among Okinawans who were 100 and plus years old. Um, and so I'll read you some of the, the, the passages from the study. Okinawan centarians sit and get up from the floor dozens or hundreds of times per day. This exercises their legs, back and core in a natural way as they get up and down all day long. Sitting on the floor also improves posture and increases overall strength, flexibility and mobility. My 88 year old elderly father still sits on his tiny plastic stool which reaches about 10 inches off of the ground to put on his shoes. He groans a little now when he gets up, but he says it is good for him. And it turns out he is right. My kids who are 19 and 22 love to laugh and share Asian memes and posts about the Asian squat. How many people have heard of the Asian squat? The half squat, or where you can kneel on the ground with your backside resting on your pointed heel, your pointed toes and resting on your heels for many minutes and sometimes even hours at a ceremony or simply sitting on the ground to eat. The Asian squat is a thing and it is something that contributes to flexibility, centering, um, as well as strength in the lower leg muscles and flexibility in your feet and in your ankles. I often wonder what advice my parents are given as I listen in on their doctor who specializes in geriatric medicine. Are my parents being told to use adaptive devices to decrease the chance of losing balance, but might increase chances of losing muscle tone, core balance, etc. My parents wore slippers all the time, a tripping hazard, I was told. But at the same time, studies from Asia show that wearing slippers over your life can actually increase and maintain agility in muscles in your feet because of the act of trying to keep your slippers on while you're moving about and doing your everyday business. I share all these stories with you because they bring up different aspects of how my own identity, my own culture, my own multiple needs for medical care information that pertains to me impacts my daily life. I'm not even someone who operates in the world of healthcare, but I do study systemic inequality. I do apply current science, social scientific research and a frame of inquiry that tells me that all of these stories represent important inflection points of considerations about equity and inequity as we look at communities as vast and diverse as the Asian Pacific Islander Desi American communities. As I pick my way through these recent interactions I have had, it is clear that a cultural framework only works if it is embedded in a systemic racism and systemic equity framework. It is not helpful to only know, for example, Chinese American worldviews of medicine if you don't understand that the impact of racism has mental health impacts, but also physical impacts from limitations of engaging in the outside world to not inter interacting or venturing out to seek assistance or resources. If the, and if there are significant differences in the impact of medication and treatments on APETA bodies versus other bodies, this undoubtedly has health impacts as well. And so I have to ask myself, how might the unquestioned centering of American mostly white medical knowledge as the normative practice for optimum health make us unable to see how other ways of moving through the world may bring better health outcomes. 
Systemic whiteness is literally killing Asian Pacific Islander Desi Americans. It is also robbing us of knowledge about preventative measure, measures, medicinal sources, and healthy living measures that could benefit other groups. There is also the model minority myth that we are doing well in terms of income, higher household income, higher educational levels than the general population. But what you may not know from population specialists who have studied minoritized individuals, that Asian Pacific Americans tend to live in areas with higher income, tend to have more income earners per household, three generations working, and many of them may be working at minimum wage, live in states with higher educational attainment on average, and that recent immigrants tend to have advanced degrees. We are the most bifurcated population with bimodalities in higher education, high income, and almost no education, formal education, and low income. So that even when someone laments that a PETA people are being beaten and murdered, we are told that your community is doing well when you know that it is not. We are living in a time when taught, when our discussions about systemic racism and our efforts to address systemic change need to be inclusive, but not necessarily blindly inclusive. What I'm asking for is for people to learn the specificities of different communities so that when we are proactive, when we are supportive, there are specifics in terms of the methodology, in terms of the content of the knowledge, as well as in terms of the diversity and heterogeneity within a group. Asian Pacific Americans are one of the most diverse communities in the world, as well as in our country. There is a huge diversity of religious identities. There are also experiences of colonization. So there is often many Western religions as well um, that are, are part of communities. There are huge dietary differences. There are huge belief systems that are different about Western medicine, about Eastern medicine, about traditional practices, and about the efficacy of following, for example, um, directions and coaching from physicians and other people in terms of um, sticking with uh, recommended health plans. And so what I wanna do today is to challenge all of you to think about what you don't know. It's really hard sometimes to think about what, what is it that I don't know? I know what I know and I know I need to know more. But a lot of times we tend to go into cookbook methods of trying to learn about the cultural values and practices of a specific community, not understanding that that community is also constantly changing, um, even as we speak. And so the message I wanna leave with all of you is to think about how your colleagues as educators, as practitioners, as fellow students are experiencing our current context in the United States as well as around the world. And I want you to challenge yourself to think about the ways in which we uphold the values and some of the cultures, centralized cultures of white American culture that sometimes goes unquestioned and certainly of white supremacy. And that it's possible for all of us to uphold white supremacy, not, not depending on our race at all. And so I, that's, that's what my, my um, admonition to you is. And so I'm gonna share with you some slides um, to give you just a little bit of data um, on what I've been speaking about. And then I will um, turn to our panels. Oops, um, I need uh, the ability to share my screen. I'm sorry, if, can someone give me that ability? And if not, it's okay. I can uh, just uh, verbally cover what's on the slides. Okay, you should be Thanks. able to. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Okay, can everyone see this? Yes, okay. So um, this slide uh, is a, a counting of um, hate incidents that have been directed at people of Asian Pacific Islander and Desi American descent across the United States. Um, you'll look at uh, the types of harassment and attacks that have been occurring. Um, with a huge number of, of involving verbal harassment and name calling um, and a lot of avoidance and shunning, um, physical assaults, others. We have, there's a new category that was just added recently because of the frequency called um, being coughed at and spat upon. 
Um, there's online harassment, workplace discrimination, and um, others, including vandalism. I know here in San Jose State, um, at, at San Jose State area, um, in the area surrounding the campus, that there has been a lot of name calling as well as graffiti and um, spitting on um, owners of small businesses, on um, people as they're going out for their walks, even in the middle of the day. It's actually something that's quite common. And so this comes from um, Stop AAP, AAPI Hate uh, org. It's being run by J Russell Jung, who is a faculty member over at um, San Francisco State. And so it's something, the numbers have gone up even since this slide was made. Sorry, I'm trying to go to the next slide here. Oh. And so what we know is um, Asian Americans suffer from having the, um, you know, being put on upon as being the perpetual foreigner. So no matter that you were born here, like I was born here, I've had people tell me to go home, to go back to China, um, you know, oh, you speak English so good. And I tell them I speak it well, actually, um, those kind of things. Um, and then also the model minority myth, right? So it's that uh, we're taking over all of the, higher ed as well as the, the good schools, um, you know, we're, we're uh, kind of machine-like, um, you know, we're not good at leadership, we're not good at verbal skills, um, we're good at test taking and we're unfairly taking up um, space in, uh, in terms of educational opportunity. And then here's an example the, of um, the type of hate that people have been experiencing for the last year and a half. We know that a lot of this is coming from um, attacks um, based on the belief that uh, somehow Chinese people and all Asian people are responsible for the, um, the COVID virus. So we'll hear things like Kung flu or um, you know the Wuhan virus, that kind of thing. And that was perpetrated, of course, by po politicians as well as um, administrations. Um, and you may think that this is a West Coast thing or uh, just mostly in New York City, a lot of the stories you hear about attacks are from both coasts, but here is um, a demonstration, very large demonstration in Grant Park in Chicago, um, where there have also there's also been a rise in attacks on people of Asian descent. Um, and then uh, this is not the first time in history, of course, we don't have time because it's not an Asian American studies class, so I can't go into all of the history. But um, at the turn of the century, um, uh, Chinatown was roped off and Chinese people were rounded up um, and being blamed for bubonic plague um, in San Francisco and in, in all, the whole state of California. This also happened in Los Angeles. Okay, um, mental health and um, perspective gaps from providers. Um, I have heard that people have gone to have have been receiving health care and somebody said to them when they said that, you know, I, I'm just tired of this Asian hate stuff and someone has said to them, um, oh, but aren't Asian people um, successful so you know you can just sort of you're you you're all doing okay compared to other groups right um, or you're economically economically protected some assumptions are made about their economic background simply because they're Asian and in this case this person said you know there's no way I'm, I'm actually in the low income um, uh, you know designation um, and also that maybe there aren't that many of you which is an a really odd thing to say um, somewhere here in the Bay Area but this was said to somebody um, and so what what people have said when there was a mental health survey done on um, AAPI folks, um, here's one of the quotes. There is this feeling among a lot of Asian Americans of, I feel like I've been screaming into an abyss that when I say I'm discriminated against, no one really believes that it's actually happening, that this is being made up. And then of course, there's the gap in the clinical research on APETA populations. Okay, so I'm gonna unshare here. So I've given you kind of an untraditional um, keynote because I think it's important for us to look at these different threads of things that are going on across the country. Um, and many of you probably can relate to what's been what what I've mentioned right and many of you maybe have seen it in your friends or your colleagues or among your families and so so when we look at. Um, the type of things that are going on and we don't think about the theoretical framework that we have and how we're approaching. Um, healthcare and culture and knowledge, then we can end up um, really losing out on either understanding the conditions that AAPI people are living under, or we lose out also on some of the health practices that could be promising. We may be misguided in giving information that is not valid um, to many different APEDA communities. And so um, that's my keynote. So, thank you. 
we are now going to move to the next portion, um, um, uh, which is we're going to have the panelists speak. So um, if I can have the panelists, um, uh, I guess, are they, are you going to introduce yourselves? I'm so sorry that I don't have this handy. Um, Should I have people? I can, is someone doing the introductions? Okay. I'm so sorry. No, no, no worries at all. Um, hi, everybody again. Um, thank you, Dr. Wong Lau, for um, really sort of situating, historicizing um, what um, people of Asian descent have experienced historically, but continue to um, have to confront in this country. And I think it's a, a, a history that is um, not told enough and definitely um, not discussed enough in our occupational therapy community. So thank you for uh, pulling that together for, for us and sharing that. Um, our panelists for this evening, uh, we have a group of um, academics, uh, practitioners and students with us. Um, a couple you've already heard from, uh, Dr. Karen Park, Dr. Louise Arabit, and then our other two um, academic panelists are Dr. Beth Ching and Dr. Uh, Rick Carrasco. Um, I'll let them say hello. Um, our practitioner, um, unfortunately, Dr. Joe Wells was uh, had to pull out, uh, but we do have Dr. Jane Koketsu with us. And then our student panelists, um, Shania Ibrahim and Sarah Gartland. So thank you all for being with us tonight. And I will turn it back over to you all to start our discussion. Great, great. So I'm gonna start um, by asking um, the first question um, and whoever would like to answer, although I think um, Jean Coquetta is, is, uh, has asked to answer this question, uh, indicated this is a question she wants to answer. So what are some of the myths or stereotypes about Asian Pacific Islander Desi communities that you would like others to understand or explore? Okay, so I mean, great question. And I think you covered a lot of things that I was already gonna say, but um, I think the stereotype of the well-adjusted, well-educated, well-to-do Asian, um, you know, needs to not be there. <laughs> because I happen to work, I live in San Jose, I grew up in LA, but I work in East San Jose, which is was the hardest hit area in Santa Clara County, in our county with COVID. And we have some very, um, and our, the biggest, uh, population that we serve in my center, in our center is from uh, Vietnamese, from the Vietnamese population. So, you know, I just want the OTs and the students, academics to know, you know, I think you know, but um, I've, I do home evaluations, hope safety evaluations. So you mentioning the little, the little Asian stool to sit on showers and it's, it's very real. I see it all the time, but, you know, I, I've done a fair share of Home, home visits, home evaluations in very, very substandard homes. So they're not all rich um, in garages, um, in, um, you know, just barely livable conditions. So, you know, we, we need to realize that not, there are of course successful, you know, people who are Asians, but at the same time in my practice, because of the communities I work with, um, you know, that's not what I see at all. So um, I, I think that's one of the things I want to I, I wish it wasn't there. Um, so that's one of them. And then the other thing, and I learn this all the time, and I realize I have so many biases myself. The older I get, the less I know. I realize how little I know. And I've been in OT for over 25 years. I've always liked working with people who are poorer, who are minority groups, who are, I'm just more comfortable in that. So my whole career, I worked for the county for a dozen years and now I work for a, a company Unlock Lifeways and we also work with very um, or Unlock Pace with diverse populations but people it's not the same so like Dr. Wong Lao said it depends on when they immigrated it depends on the culture or the race they came from and just because I grew up as a Japanese American with my parents as immigrants doesn't mean that my experience is the same so um, so I learn all the time what I don't know but um, I think I have a little knowledge of how it is to be uh, an immigrant because of my, my parents, you know, I would help interpret and things like that. And my Japanese language ability is actually quite poor. I can understand more than I can speak, but at the same time, you know, um, you know, I could really relate to Dr. Wong Lao. My parents are also, they're in their eighties. So I've had, you know, 
I've looked at the prescriptions and my mom had a total hip and I couldn't believe the 10 pages of information she got, you know, it was so complicated. And, you know, so, so for my career as an OT, I try, we always try to use uh, visuals in terms of pictures and things that are materials that are translated. It's really, really important. And also interpreters as much as we can. So, so those are just a couple of things that I, I thought of in terms of, you know, what I would like to dispel. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share? We got one more person share on this question. I can, we share. Go I can share. Go ahead. So for me, um, one of the biggest and I would say most annoying stereotype is that all AAPI people are of the same background or national heritage. Um, people are unable to or unwilling actually to take the time to distinguish between various Asian ethnicities, uh, whether it's be, it be Korean American or uh, Chinese American or Filipino American, Malaysian American, Indonesian American. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, this becomes a problem because people generalize and attribute certain philosophies or practices to the entire um, Asian American population. So people fail to see the rich diversity and culture offered by, uh, by, by other Asian ethnicities. And I believe this reduces and overlooks the important differences mm -hmm. among Asian, you know, various Asian ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. um, the other stereotype, I, by the way, I love your slipper, <laughs> your slipper <laughs> thing, you know, because it's so true, you know, true. in American society, you know, we don't want that, <laughs> but in an Asian, you know, it's, it's different. The other stereotype is that, I, I, I think you touched on this already, is that all Asian American people of heritage are foreigners in this country. People can seem to uh, distinguish that many families that reside here that are of Asian descent have been US citizens for generations. When we are perceived as foreigners, then we become a target of prejudice and, and discrimination and, and racism and can be denied the same access and rights to other fellow Americans. Mm -hmm. So as, as a person of color and uh, as I identify with the Asian American Pacific Islander population, you know, we are Americans too, and we are not invisible. And people need to see us and hear us and, and talk with us. So sometimes when people ask me, where are you from? You know, whether this is out of <laughs> curiosity, this can, yeah. for me, can be looked at as a microaggression or an implicit bias or what I would also term as casual racism, it really infuriates me when I'm asked this all the time. Um, asking me where I'm from indicates to me I do not belong, mm -hmm. uh, that my history is not mm -hmm. you know, considered important in this country. It seems like you know, Americans consider Asian Americans as, you know, as true foreigners or outsiders. Yeah. I am an American, period. <laughs> Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're asking me what my racial background is. That's a different, you know, story, and I would be willing to share that. I guess those are just my two stereotypes that I am really annoyed about. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask the students if you want to chime in, or you want to answer some of the other questions? So, um, Sarah, do you want do you want do you have anything else to say, or do you want to answer another question? Um, I was going to save my answer for the aha moment, but I, yes, okay, no, no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> um, Something to this first question, yeah. I think going on with Dr. Arabit had shared, I, I think also because of we, ha we have such a diverse experience within our cultures, things that are so beloved to our cultures, our traditions and our food and our language, but I think each one of our cultures also carries what we consider almost like an intergenerational trauma too. So being Korean American, you know, we have had a history with like colonization and the Korean war and, you know, separate being separated from family. And I feel like all of our cultures have that experience in some way. And I think really acknowledging that is so important too. Um, Cause that's, that's a part of what we carry in our daily existence too. Um, and so when we feel like in our communities or in our society, we're felt like others and we don't belong, you know, we're carrying that piece of yeah. this history and this trauma as well. Thank you, thank you. Um, um, what about Karen Park? You indicated you'd like to answer, Karen? Oh, that was me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, my eyes are really bad <laughs> on the small screen. I'm on my laptop, so I apologize. I'm so sorry. Okay, all right. Uh, Dr. Wong Lao, I just want, this is Beth Ching. I just wanted sure. to say oh. um, uh, really short that we don't all look alike. No matter where, I've been an occupational therapist since 1985, and no matter where I've worked, 
I always call it, I don't have the eye shape privilege. I don't have round eyes. I have almond shaped eyes. And it appears that many people in our society think that everybody that has almond shaped eyes looks the same. Yes. I've been, um, the first position I worked in an acute psychiatric setting and um, people mistaken, mistake, uh, uh, I was mistaken for the dietitian. And all, all the people I've been mistaken for are lovely folks and nothing against them. Right. Um, but it's just that it's just that it, it seems like we don't have a personality and people cannot distinguish, even though there's decades apart, sometimes the people that we are mistaken for. And my current position at a university, I'm often mistaken for another colleague. Um, again, not good on her end because I'm at least 10 years older than her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> good on my end. People think I'm youthful, I guess. I don't know. But nevertheless, it's um. It's very uh, disturbing, and of course, I always play it off, and I always, uh, you know, being part of our Asian humility, uh, giving people face, I always play it off, make a joke, um, but it's very hurtful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's happened to a lot of us, I'm pretty sure, yeah. If I may say something, this is Rick Carrasco. Uh, yes, please. Uh, you touched lightly on the sense of history, which I really was touched about. Because I think that um, with history, we learn about what our generations before us have gone through. Mm -hmm. And there's so much about Asian history mm -hmm. that needs to be learned, not just the good things, but also the sad things mm -hmm. that happen. Mm -hmm. The lynching that we see in the, on television, the murders of um, the uncalled for death of some people. Are you, are you referring to Vincent color. Chin, uh, Dr. Carrasco? I'm sorry? Are you referring to Vincent Chin? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that, that takes us back to some of the things that are really similar to what's happening now, but it happened a while ago. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot to be learned yeah. about those things. Absolutely. Then again, there's history that's set by our ancient philosophers. And well, so those are the good things. And uh, so I thought that I'd mention mm -hmm. both, uh, partly because I think that we need to look at both. Mm -hmm. Very powerfully stated. Pleasant and yeah. Yeah, thank you. And uh, talking about history, do you mind if I jump in real quick? Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, in, I started taking classes in Asian American studies, you know, when I was in college in the 80s. And that's when I realized, wow, this is a history I've never learned ever. I only learned about the Mayflower and, you know, all of that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know, you know, I because my parents were immigrant, I don't know, maybe I felt like I was just ballooned in and dropped and that was our history. But I really didn't know anything. So it was really great for me to learn. And that's when my the scales fell off like, wow, I'm part of this country and part of this heritage. So I would highly recommend educating yourself. And if you're interested and curious and PBS has an excellent five part series, you can watch it free on YouTube called Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. And it talks about some of the things yes. that were mentioned, but I would highly recommend watching those, mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. series. Yeah. There are also some things that are happening right now uh, for example, uh, somebody who's here with us right now has a relative who is very active in uh, the things that are happening in the Asian community. And the, uh, I believe it's the Asian, Lillian, uh, your, uh, the Asian Museum of uh, yeah. Fine Arts. Uh, well, there's multiple things. I'm sorry to interrupt it and cut me off because I get very verbose, but I'm a, uh, Chinese American born here. My parents came from China. And so many of the factors, there's many layers of what you're talking about because uh, we have immigrants like Rick who, who was not born here. We have the Asian Americans who were born here with their own identity and um, non-country. You know, I'm, I'm a five foot 10 Chinese first generation. And that's so atypical compared to the typical Asian women who are five foot six and petite and beautiful. So I think there's a lot of layers of the history behind the anti, the Chinese Exclusion Act, what then transfers into all Asians 
because we all look alike. You know, so a lot of those topics were discussed with you all, but Jack Chen, T-C-H-E-N, is at Rutgers University and what they're, what the process has been with this anti-hate um, uh, crimes is that, yes, we were not educated in the 80s about uh, Asian American discrimination, even though we knew about the Japanese internment and why did that happen? Mm -hmm. But um, the series that was mentioned, the five part series is very good. There's an ongoing dialogue that um, I'll send the references to Rick to, you know, post on wherever you want to post it, that are multiple resources for all of you to look at in an ongoing dialogue. Um, the Chinese American Museum in Chicago is having a five part series of pal panel discussions with different Asian American historians and talking about the Asian American hate. Um, Jack is doing, he's at Rutgers University now. He started the program at NYU and started the Museum of the Chinese Americans and has many d displays and, um, you know, moving forward, uh, the Yellow Peril book, if you all look at it, will show the depiction of the, the um, colonialism. And that's the focus now is showing the colonialism as how it is, had, how it impairs all races that are not the colonialist white race. Mm -hmm. And that affects us. I think as individuals of Asians, we are told to be quiet, be honorable. I mean, I texted, I put a chat about my experience in OT school was, I, I am always an overachiever student and I was criticized by my professor for, you know, what are you trying to prove? You know, you should be out drinking with us. Well, I don't drink number one. And I was, had other reasons why I didn't go to the bars, but I was docked my, for not socializing with my peers. And I socialize in different ways, but not drinking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those, those are subtle things that happen that, that are, uh, you know, people don't understand why, you know, why do we behave the way we are? I mean, my family was, all my siblings and I were evaluated by the high school, college um, psychologists, you know, why, is, why in one family do all of you have you know, exceptional, you know, uh, work ethics or grades. So, um, you know, it, it is an, ex you know, that's the exception to the, the rule. And, and I, sorry, I took so much time, but hopefully, you know, you, Rick will have you know, all that in there. It. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, would love to hear from the students. Mm -hmm. So if uh, we haven't heard any student voices, and so I know that there's, um, Sh is it Shania? Shania. Shania Ibrahim. Yeah, I'd love to give um, a personal, um, you know, viewpoint on some of the stereotypes and myths. So just going back onto um, the model minority myth that was discussed earlier, I think what's very important with this is that it doesn't recognize, um, you know, the pressures and paradoxes that are inherent within the Asian American identity, but as well as the diversity of different um, APIDA um, American cultures. And so for me personally, both of my parents immigrated from Indonesia back in 1994. And so they have always held um, minimum, minimum wage jobs growing up. So they don't really fit that, you know, stereotypical Asians have it all. Like they are very successful. They work in those, um, you know, higher paying jobs, being a doctor, a lawyer, or you know, some sort of successful career. And so that growing up, it was hard watching my parents lose sleep, just trying to give me and my sister everything that we needed um, in order to live out this American dream that they moved here for to give us. And so my sister, she's an immigrant. And when she chose to attend college, she didn't receive any financial aid. She didn't, um, you know, receive anything like that. And so she had to pay out of state tuition because she didn't have that citizenship status. And so just putting that into perspective it's like a lot there's a lot of assumptions on like oh hey this girl's asian or she identifies as such so she must work really hard she does well in school um and so i just feel like that's not normally the case because that's that automatic assumption mm -hmm. and so also just some of the things that i heard personally growing up like throughout school and even to this present day is like going back to what dr um a rabbit said, I'm sorry if I apologize if I pronounce that wrong, um, but like the question of asking, where are you really from? Or the 
you know, assumption that we eat cats and dogs at home or just being referred to as things such as like Ling Ling or Ching Chong and just things like that. Um, that just automatically is the things that come to mind um, for my personal experiences. Um, but also I have found if when I'm applying to like jobs or schools, people automatically assume that, oh, you're totally going to get in and because they need, you know, people of color in their program. And that kind of just undermines um, my qualifications as an individual to get into a program, but just really highlights, oh, I'm going to get in because I'm going to add color to the pot. And so it kind of just like has undermined it, like my achievements in the past. And so I really feel like by dismantling that myth, the steps we would need to take is to raise awareness in not only yourself, but also um, in those around you, but also noting the individual differences that exist within our community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to uh, share anything or can I go on to the next question? Sorry, you can go on to the next one. I'll save okay. it for the next. Okay. The next question is uh, cultural competency is sometimes seen as a value, is seen as value neutral on systemic racism. So you get all, you know, you get this chapter or this reading on cultural competency about a certain group, a specific group. Um, what are potential impacts in terms of care provider patient relationships and eventual health outcomes if a scholar, student, or practitioner does not think of the impact of racism on APEDA communities? So if you just sort of do, I'm just going to look at cultural competency. I'm going to ignore the fact that um, APEDA folks are impacted by race. What, what are the potential negative um, outcomes. And so, Sarah, if you want to take a crack at that because you haven't had a chance to speak, um, you can go right ahead and do that if you'd like. Well, kind of just going back to the, um, you know, monolith theme that we're going with. I mean, that, the, you know, there's huge variance of cultural identity within there in terms of people talked about diet, um, religion, um, just family values and the intergenerational living and stuff. So I think not understanding that and in how you practice will affect the, the people that we're trying to serve. Right, right. thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I think that Karen would like to answer this. The next one. <laughs> next one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm uh, reading it in chat. Okay, great. Okay. I can answer this. Uh, go ahead. Thanks. So uh, thank you for this question. So I think that uh, APIDA communities have their own needs, just like any other, you know, minority groups in this country. Let me just say that, you know, a study uh, that was done by the Institute of Medicine in 2014 uh, stated that when healthcare practitioners are as diverse as they can be, it stimulates the health of a specific population. So I thought that was really, really interesting. And really good, you know, uh, it gives us a, a study that, you know, if you're someone from a different culture and you're working in, um, you know, with a, a, another culture, another population, it stimulates that, that population's health. So I've seen this when I was an OT practitioner, you know, when you work with someone who is the same as you, it looks the same as you um, and wants to work with you. Um, now as an academic, um, it is also important to understand, I think, the cultural backgrounds of our of our students and the people in general we, we work with um, so we can uh, provide service to our customers, our public, and, and know the struggles in particular with the AAPI community. So the way I look at it is like for our clients, if we don't know what AAPI is and the needs of the AAPI, then they might not get the proper healthcare they need, just like what you're telling me, the story of your, 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 your dad. So as, as practitioners, we provide the most you know, cultural, diverse, equitable, and exclusive OT eval and intervention when we work with our clients. Do we? Do we do that? Are we talk, Are we taking time to know their story and incorporating that in our practice? As a faculty member, um, I think without faculty understanding the cultural strengths and, and background of their students, uh, many of us may not be able to teach effectively and impart the knowledge that we want to impart because we forget that people learn differently from different backgrounds, you know. So it's important for us to take that into consideration as a faculty and, and develop and consider developing strategies or teaching strategies from an, indiv from an individualized to a more integrated type of teaching or model. 
And uh, as a researcher, we need to also be very inclusive. You know, we have to be diverse and equitable in promoting research that focuses on the needs of AAPI populations. How many of us do that? Are we being reflexive and reflective in our research and considering the needs of you know, these populations? So Great. that's all. Thank you. Anyone else want to answer this question? Go ahead, Beth. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, we like to use the term cultural responsiveness um, in terms of our work with the clients and patients and also with students. As I believe that um, it's more like adult learning to me, it's a lifelong process, whereas uh, cultur um, cultural competency sounds like a checklist and it's an endpoint. Mm -hmm. And so I like to use the term cultural responsiveness. And I think if we don't do that, I think um, we'll sometimes we've learned when I went to OT school the first time, it was kind of like treat um, the golden rule, treat the patients like you would like to be treated. But what we say now is it's the platinum rule. Uh, treat people how they want to be treated and we also miss out on a lot of trauma unfortunately with um, our Apida communities because let's face it a lot of us have gone through a lot of trauma but I think again to me um, I've, I've had the pleasure of uh, working in uh, uh, I have some di uh, diversity training um, so I have had the pleasure of uh, working with folks from all walks of life and it's interesting to me because like when I work with my African American colleagues, uh, when they go through some trauma, um, I'm just saying this as a blanket statement, this, I don't know if this holds true for everyone. So I just want to say I'm not trying to represent everybody. But when they go through trauma, we get together and we talk about it, right? And we rant, we rave and we process it and get it through. Now, for me, even though I'm a third generation, I was raised by Asian parents. <laughs> and that to me means that when I go through something, there's a lot of shame around it. And there's a lot of like, oh my God, like, you know, I don't want other people to know that I'm going through this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I think I misses out on a lot of healing because my background is in mental health. And I think there's a lot of healing that we can do communally because I think so many BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, people of color, our communities are collective. You know, we share our joys and our and our sorrows. And so when we're not out, 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 able to do that, then I think it compounds, it compounds the trauma. So I really like your question, uh, Dr. Wong Lao, because I think that's so important. And the cultural competency piece, I mean, even in terms of occupations, you know, when we talk about occupation, meaningful activities for people, a lot of times colleagues that aren't from AP, the communities, they think, oh, even around eating, oh, well, I check off because I've included chopsticks. And when we know, like, you know, like a lot of our cultures, we eat, we eat with our hands. We don't eat with chopsticks, you know? So, I mean, I think there's this, a lot of these assumptions that we just, if we took the time, if people really took the time to uh, be there for us, they would know. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone may call me Kathy, but thank you. Thank you so much, Beth, for sharing that. It's a very heartfelt and very very accurate, I think, uh, in terms of uh, what the data shows too, right? That that the uh, the group that most underutilizes um, mental health services on America's uh, college campuses are APETA folks, right? By something like uh, threefold underutilization, right? So yeah, great, thank you. Um, uh, should I go on to the next question? Okay, so what are elements of your own APEDA cultural insights or practices that you bring into your teaching, curriculum development, professional practice, and long-term education? So self-education or education in general, but also maybe into your practice. So Karen, I know you got dibs on answering this, so go right ahead. <laughs> I think this is a nice kind of continuation of the dis discussion that Beth also brought up around mental health. Um, and I, I also want to acknowledge that May is also mental, mental Health Awareness Month too. So I think there is this intersection of Asian American experience and identity and the trauma that we experience and also mental health. Um, so I understand there's still a lot of stigma and shame around mental health within our community. And I am an educator. I'm a second generation Korean American. I am an educator. I'm a doctoral coordinator in an OTD program. And um, 
these are some of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of my, my teaching practice and how to be more trauma informed or be aware of kind of the situations and experiences our students are, are having. Because first we carry that inter intergenerational trauma, whatever that may be from our family history, but then it's how we process the discrimination and then the microaggressions and then the feelings of exclusions that we may experience. Um, and this was something that happened actually a couple days after the, the shootings in Atlanta, the murders in Atlanta where I have an OTD student who her project is on the occupational impact of um, individuals that have experienced mass shootings. And I'm not her lead coordinator, but it was on my calendar and it was like 9 a.m. She was doing a defense presentation on her OTD. And, and I, I knew her topic, but I went to this meeting or to this presentation and I just was not okay <laughs> in that moment. And I had to go off camera and I had to just kind of collect myself. And, you know, like there are these triggers now and we, we, kind, we might refer to them as tertiary types of trauma or tertiary exposure to trauma where I'm I'm very distant from Atlanta it's not anyone that I know personally but that it affected my community and it brought so many feelings and emotions and grief um, around kind of the the crimes and the violence within our community mm -hmm. That tertiary exposure to trauma really had an impact on me. Um, and I was really struggling with being professional. Uh, and then I had students that are also Asian American and they were struggling with, you know, being in class and being present and meeting deadlines. And, you know, they were afraid of being unprofessional. And we were discussing this in a faculty meeting about like, how do we address this? How do we support our students? And, and someone mentioned like, well, we need to be professional. And I, I've really been stuck on this idea because I'm annoyed. <laughs> Some people have said that we're annoyed. So I'm, I'm annoyed by this idea of professionalism and what does that mean? And can we decolonize professionalism? Because now I'm feeling like professionalism is this word that we use to cover suppressing of our emotions and grief. And it's dissociating and compartmentalizing and now it's silencing our community. And now it's dehumanizing us that we have to not feel these emotions in the name of being professional in our, in our you know, academic or professional spaces too. So I'm really trying to think about what that means, you know, for my students. Do we extend, de do we extend deadlines? Do we cancel non-essential meetings? You know, do we provide more support? Do we allow, you know, time and space for, for discussions and processing and healing together? Um, is that our responsibility as educators? I think so. Um, but those are kind of some of the things that I'm really trying to integrate into my, myself, uh, my teaching practices, because I think it's important for me as a human to feel like I'm a part of this community and hopefully we all care about each other too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you so much. Would anyone else like to, I, I like, I, I put, um, I don't have the year of citation, but I put Okun and Jones have written about professionalism as a colonizing practice um, that, uh, that is used to uh, control others, right? And to police others, so in organizations. Um, I'd like to say something. Go ahead, please. Please, Rick. Thank um, you. Related to uh, embedding my culture into uh, my teaching and my administration. Um, I grew up as an OT uh, in the old traditions, uh, have over 40 years of uh, experience in the profession. And many of those years have been in academia. And uh, so as the person that designed the program at the Nova Southeastern University, uh, it was a challenge for me to uh, propose a hybrid program when it was not really <laughs> the, thing, the thing to do. Uh, and so it's really a contrast to what I grew up with. But then at the same time, because we don't see our students on a regular basis, I had to find a way that I could connect what I grew up with, with how we do things as a program. And so I'm sure you guys have heard of the implicit curriculum or the hidden curriculum, which focuses on celebrations and all of these things that are good that the students are go, go through and you celebrate them. And so we start out our, um, program uh, for entering students with an entrance colloquium, which is a celebration of different things that we do as individuals. And we start out with me starting the first day, first hour 
of the entrance of the two day entrance colloquium with all the students, all 40 of them going into the room and what they find are bunches of food to make a hot lunch. And it's a Filipino recipe for lumpia. I don't know if you guys have had lumpia. It's yeah. a mixture of vegetables <laughs> and it's sauteed together with anado seeds and tasty peanut sauce. And they all learn. And then at the same time, they get to celebrate each other and know each other in the process, a group dynamics kind of thing in a Filipino way. But at the same time, at the end of the day, we celebrate each other for having, actually, we celebrate at lunch when we eat together. And all throughout the three and a half years that the students are there, their experience, their journey with our OTD program is spotted with celebrations, starting with the fall ceremonies that celebrate each one for whatever they had accomplished during that time of their uh, education at the university. Mm. So I found a marriage of what I grew up with, with some strategic ways by which the whole program celebrates each other mm. through a hidden curriculum. And it's not so hidden because they know that we celebrate every time we turn around. So. <laughs> It's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Great. I'm going to go to the last question. We have 12 minutes left. I'm going to go to the last question. And I think this one is one that Sarah wants to answer as indicated before this that she wanted to answer. So here's uh, the question. Share an aha moment you have had, any transform transformative insight or practice on curriculum, pedagogy, practicum coaching, or other areas that would help the audience understand how to begin to change how occupational therapy education integrates Asian Pacific Islander Desi Americans into health education. So go right ahead, Sarah. Uh, yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I don't know how this quite integrates into curriculum and whatnot, but I will say my aha moment that I had recently was, you know, I'm, I'm going to school in Atlanta, Georgia, and I grew up in Ohio, a Filipino American where there was not a lot of Filipinos. <laughs> and, mm. you know, my, um, my dad was trying just so hard to like fit in. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, we, we certainly experienced our fair share of racism and, and whatnot, but, um, I've always kind of in my mind thought of it as like, we don't have it near as bad as like, of our African American friends and in all this social unrest leading up to this, you know, it almost felt like I can't say anything about, you know, what, what you know, at these rising Asian American hate crimes. And, and then when the shooting happened in Atlanta, the mass shootings that happened in Atlanta, and it really struck home. And I had friends, um, you know, from all over the country calling to check on us and, and our, you know, Asian community here in Atlanta kind of pulling together and you know, just ha having those same feelings of almost like, gosh, this is so horrible, but it doesn't even compare. And then reading something that was like, yeah, duh, it's not about comparing who has it worse. <laughs> you know, it's all horrible. Like um, any kind of discrimination or racism is horrible. And so it's about working together and, you know, examining what I'm feeling, examining what other people are experiencing and just working to make it better and that i mean it sounds so simple just saying it out loud but it really was a big aha moment for me to feel like i am allowed to have those feelings <laughs> and experiences and it's just not about comparing um who has it worse but what we can do to make it better thank you anyone else want to share an aha moment on the panel and and if not, um, go right ahead, Jean. Oh, Jean, and then oh, Beth. Okay, I think a, a aha moment I had this year. I, I serve on the OTAC, the OT Association for California um, ad hoc committee for DEI 
And um, so we've been meeting since last fall and, you know, we have, to, we have to have some deliverables and, you know, things like that that's understood. But one of the ahas I had is every single time our subcommittee would meet, there's seven of us in our team and 30 overall. But whenever our team would meet, it was always after a major national event, after, right after the Capitol riots, right after the Atlanta shootings. And there are other things. And we literally meet a couple of days later. And, um, you know, for me, I, I've been thinking about the professionalism. Oh my goodness, we have so much work to do. What should we do? Should we talk about it? But, but I, I think what I learned is, you know, just giving space I'm not even kidding, three to five minutes of just saying, are you okay? Wow, that really sucked, you know, and just kind of giving it space. And our team, we are getting to know each other, we've known each other. So we have an understanding of the pain of it kind of corporately, but just giving a few minutes of space really um, helps, um, has helped our group. So, you know, I'm just speaking to our team but I, I feel like it's it's helped. So even some of that, and also, um, you know, just acknowledging, I think is a good thing. And sometimes I think for the uh, professors and others, you know, like Dr. Park said, it's hard on us too. I teach, you know, uh, uh, you know, once in a while at San Jose State, but when things happen, we're also processing. It's not always easy to just, you know, acknowledge it right away because it, it's just, you know, the Atlanta shootings really hit me hard too and having this extra vigilance and um you just you know i had to tell my college age son don't go running by yourself i my uh, husband's auntie just a few two weeks ago in our area was you know screamed at the car slowed down and they screamed at her are you chinese you know and then they slowed down and backed up and came back again so you know these things are happening so i think that there are triggers like that so i think um in terms of I think it's helpful also to just check in with people, you know, not solving their problem for them, but just even asking is helpful. How are you doing? Are you okay with what happened? Not really, but, or they'll say, yes, I'm okay, but just thanks for asking. So I think that's been meaningful to me when people just ask. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Beth, go right ahead. Yes. I want to agree that that is very powerful. Um, I, I just want to say that I, you know what's come to mind is I'm, I'm, um, I'm getting towards the downslope of my career in occupational therapy, and you know what I've discovered is that I, you know, I've decided I'm just going to be my authentic self as much as I can, and um, so I feel like you know again I I come from Vallejo, which um, Vallejo, California is in Northern California. It's unfortunately one of the, um, it's, the it's the greatest thing because it's the most diverse city um, in terms of like a quarter of the population being white, black, um, Asian Pacific Islander, and then a quarter being Latinx. But also what's difficult about um, coming from there is that like, um, I come from a really, um, again, I wasn't poor, but I come from a low income neighborhood and um, it's just there's a lot of assumptions people make about us, I think, as Asian Pacific Islander, uh, Desi American folks. And so, you know, I always feel like where I come from Vallejo, it's mainly a black neighborhood, um, actually. So when I think my, to myself, I'm like, people, don't, yeah, they don't know me. You know, they're making all these assumptions about me. Like um, my niece is, uh, uh, identifies black and Asian, right? So she's Blasian, right? Um, my son, half my family through marriage, they're Latinx, right? They're, my son's Chino Latino, right? He's uh, Asian uh, uh, Latino, right? And so I don't say that like, oh, I have a black friend or I have a, a Latino friend. This is my family, you know? And so this whole thing that K Kathy mentioned about, like we're close to white folks. And again, nothing around wrong with white folks. I'm just saying to be invisible where people will say like racist stuff in front of me because I'm white adjacent. I hate that term. Yeah. I'm not white adjacent, yeah. you know, so why are you saying all this crap in front of me? Mm -hmm. And then again, I have to pick my battles all the time, right? Because we don't always want to say, uh, you know, they're, oh, Beth, she's just playing the race card again, and she has a chip on her shoulder and, you know, that whole thing. And so it's just really hard. So I guess to me, I'm just saying, you know what, I'm this age where I'm like, too bad, I'm going to be more of myself and not, you know, have to um, be very guarded. Mm -hmm. I feel like, a lot of work in our profession, you have to be really guarded because it is a very, um, it's a very white 
profession. I mean, in many respects, I mean, that's changing, which is fabulous. But again, I, I think there's a lot of things that are core to our history mm -hmm. that makes it really hard to show up as your authentic self. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Very powerful. Thank you. Um, Shania, would you like to say anything? Or? Yes, I actually wanted to say something. Um, thank you for this question, Kathy. Um, but I felt like I had a similar aha moment to what Sarah had mentioned um, before, um, really thinking that we didn't have it as bad as Asian Americans as those of um, the BIPOC community. And then the recent, you know, hate started happening and then the mass shootings and like that did affect me um, personally. And so I really feel like individuals from all communities, whether that be BIPOC, the APIDA, Latino community, um, we all face re racism in many facets of life. And so just acknowledging that this is real, having those uncomfortable conversations, um, both professionally and personally, but also incorporating these communities into research and classroom curriculum is really how we can become evident populations in health education. And so I feel like complacency can perhaps be the greatest diversity related obstacle um, facing universities today. And so inclusion needs to be more than just checking a box. And so I say, just be proud of who you are, um, where you came from and just share that with the world because representation matters. Thank you, thank you. And Sarah? I wanna say something, Kathy. Okay, go ahead. My, my aha moment actually is working with this group um, Dr. Cheng and Dr. Park and the COTAD group. I know it was a, a morning when I texted Dr. Ambarisade. I was asking her, you know, um, I was so distressed about what's going on in our, in our country right now, especially the hate against um, Asian Americans. And, uh, and just, you know, with that, with that text, um, you know, I had Dr. Park and Dr. Cheng all involved through COTAD. I also want to thank uh, Kalia from Kotad, you know, this is my aha moment. That's why we're talking. We're having this dialogue right now. And I'm just grateful to everyone. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Um, I think that this, this has been an incredible evening. Um, I think that the wisdom and the passion that's been shared and the insights, I think, are, are, are ones that I think many of us can relate to. And even if we've never experienced it ourselves, we've certainly seen it happen to other people. Um, and so having this, you know, I, I do wanna share, and I know that Karen is the expert here probably on 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 what the emotional harms are of, of being suppressed or being invisible, right? So a lot of times we think, um, I'm thinking of Beth just sort of saying, you know, too bad, so sad, right? I mean, that's how I feel some days. Um, but but I think that when we when we decide to avoid talking about these issues and self-reflecting and processing in community with other people, I think that we cause so much harm to ourselves, but also we model um, we model behavior that's unhealthy for other people. I'm very conscious in my leadership role of trying to, to model what, what processing looks like. And it can be very scary and it can be really poorly done. It can be, you know, people can work a walk away feeling very um, emotionally um, tired. But at the same time, how many people have been in a room where you know what the elephant is in the room and no one will say anything and everyone acts like everything is fine? That is just so, it's so soul killing, right? Um, when we think about our psyches. And so I really appreciate this space that was made um, by all of you, by the panelists, by the organizers, but also by all of the warm nods and, and looks of um, recognition, I think, um, in, the, in the Zoom room. Um, I know that sometimes we say Zoom is not a good medium, but um, I think that in this case, it has, it has worked um, to bring us together. Um, you know, and it would be different if we were in the same room, but I but really appreciate the, the level of transparency, willingness to share um, and be vulnerable, um, but also um, because you, you want to be able to help other people as well um, in this group. So, um, so just, I'm just so grateful um, and feel very honored um, to be amongst all of you. And I see all the student faces here. I'm assuming some of you are students, but, um, uh, and educators and practitioners, um, it's uh, really inspiring to know, I wish I had had these kind of conversations when I was a student, um, and these weren't these weren't normative when I was a student. Um, so, thank you.
Yeah, thank you all again. Y'all please join me in um, thanking Dr. Wan La and all of our panelists for sharing um, with us this evening, giving of themselves for our learning. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, all of you. And so to kind of help us recenter, um, I'm gonna share my screen again and turn it over to Dr. Chang. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, so um, this is a, an activity I'd like to um, preface by just saying, and we're going to be taking some deep breaths um, because we engaged in um, a wonderful um, occupation together and um, we're gonna be doing that. But I just wanted to preface it by letting you know where it comes from. Um, this was a practice that I did with older adults when I, um, worked with uh, older adults in a partial hospitalization program. Um, and we did it in a chair. So that's why I chose it tonight because I thought, oh, we're all gonna be sitting uh, for the most part. Um, and I also do this in an activity I'm, uh, excuse me, in a course that I'm very honored to teach uh, called health promotion and wellness. And honestly, um, I was asked why there were several people that wanted to teach the course as a fun course. And I, and I was asked uh, why I should be the perfect person to teach it. And to be truthful with you, one of the reasons I said was because I, um, I identify as a uh, Asian American. And in this course, we talk about all of our beautiful Pan-Asian um, health practices that oftentimes are not attributed to our beautiful uh, Apita cultures. Yoga, mindfulness has its origins in Buddhism. So I feel that it's, you know, a lot of our cultural practices are in the mainstream now, and I just want to just call it out for the history behind some of these wonderful, beautiful spiritual practices that we take for granted. So with that, if you would get sit in a in a position where your feet are flat on the floor, if possible, and have your arms to your side a little bit loose, and you can close your eyes if you choose to. If you, if you don't want to close your eyes, that's perfectly fine too, but would you please put your arms to uh, excuse me, your hands together and put them up, uh, bring them straight up and inhale while you do that. Inhale, bring your arms up. Great, pause a minute and exhale and bring them out like you're, it's the sunset. Your arms are going out on the exhale. Good, that was our practice one. You ready? Okay, let's do the second one. Inhale, put your arms up, getting ready to make that sun and then bring your arms down in a in an arc <sighs> exhale good shake your arms out a little bit if you choose last one please make it good inhale <sighs> and exhale let that sunset come out honestly i'm on pacific time it's not quite sunset but thank you all of you folks on eastern Central and Mountain Time for sticking with us out here in the West. Um, again, thank you so much for your presence. And I just feel so supported being here at COTAD and I wanna give uh, proper uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Uh, uh, Anvarizade for hearing our, our calls of um, wishes for solidarity. And again, thank you, it's been a pleasure. I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Dr. Anvarizade. Wow, <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing, Dr. Ching. I feel so relaxed. Thank you, actually, everyone. Uh, the panelists, the keynote, oh my goodness. Oof, I, I just, I feel chill. Anyway, um, I hope that you all enjoyed this evening's discussion and will apply the action steps to your daily roles as practitioners and as students, I'd like to these conversations and welcome all of you to join the space again. And remember to be mindful that intention does not equal impact. Make a difference, be an accomplice, and take action. Have a lovely evening and thank you everyone for your wonderful energy, time, and attention. Have a one. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, bye. everybody. Thank you.
All right. Well, thank you all again. I echo Arame would say like I have chills and you know, and I've shared this before with Karen, Louie, and Beth in our conversations that the last thing you want to be able to connect with people is share trauma, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, it is part of the American experience for us, right? Um, and just to hear the, just the, the very same things that you all have to, to have to go through, it's, it's heartbreaking, honestly, um, but I appreciate you know, you're sharing your stories because it's people in OT need, need to hear it. They don't, they don't have exposure enough. Um, and I, I really hope that they, they take these narratives and, and use it to fuel um, the, the cultural shifts needed for us to really, I think, engage with all the communities we serve in, in an inclusive and anti-racist way, for sure. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And Happy you Yes, Thank Patty, you. so nice to meet you. And again, just a wonderful job. <laughs> Thank you. Kathy, so you were phenomenal. Much, Kathy. Oh yes, Kathy, oh fabulous. God. Fantastic. Oh. Phenomenal. Thank you so much. Well, gosh, the I, I think the 